think I guess you can get started and maybe during the introduction there'll be more of uh, participants streaming in. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, joining us on uh, in a nice evening. Um, today we have a quite an exciting topic that will be discussed uh, by our guest speaker. So, um, but first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Vanessa. I'm co-founder of the Golden Concepts, and um, just a gentle reminder that this session will be recorded. So, um, so and also uh, we would like to keep all the participants' audio off. But if you do have any questions along the way, uh, as the speaker is going through her talk, um, do feel free to post your questions in the uh, chat. Yeah, you can find the chat button at the bottom of the screen, uh, at the bottom of the window. Once you click on chat, you can actually just type in your question there. Um, so just a quick introduction about um, the Golden Concepts, which is uh, our company that's uh, organizing this talk today. Um, we, we are a company that uh, we are focused on curating a range of quality elder care products uh, to enable aging well. So in particular, our products are focused um, not just on rehab, but more in terms of maximizing the mobility and independence of our seniors so that we can enjoy our golden years. Um, but besides products, right, which is um, quite a large part of what we do, we also do believe a lot in outreach and educational um, efforts and events uh, such as uh, these talks. So where we believe in uh, engaging in the right partners and getting the, getting the experts in to weigh in on certain topics that are very relevant to us. Um, so that's why this year we started this thing called the Golden Concepts Virtual Talk uh, Series. Uh, particularly on the topic of aging well, which as we all know, uh, is a topic that a lot of us uh, think about. And it's also a very broad topic. So we have actually brought together a whole range of experts in a field of uh, elder care, um, from physical, psychological, social. And our aim would ultimately to build, to be to build a community uh, that's interested to learn together. Um, and hopefully this will be a good platform for us to, to start to work on that. Yeah, so today we are very um, honoured to have uh, our friend from Ojoy uh, with us today. Um, so a quick uh, introduction about Ojoy um, is that they, they provide counselling and clinical case management services uh, with a holistic approach. So they focus um, on bio, psycho and social needs. And through these services, they aim to empower seniors to improve their mental well-being and increase their resilience to cope with life's Challenges. I hope yet thing I did <laughs> a good introduction of that. Of that, um, you can probably share with you more later. And also, uh, we are very happy to have yet thing, uh, who is the principal counselor at Ojoy. Uh, I understand that she actually changed her career from research fellow, uh, to counselor after a personal experience, and she has been with Ojoy for twelve years. So, um, we are very happy that you are you know going to share your 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 experience and expertise with us. Um, and today she'll be, <laughs> yeah. And today she'll be sharing about uh, when mental wellness in seniors. Uh, actually, a two-part series because there's so much content to cover. So um, starting with today's topic, uh, part one uh, on depression. And I hope you guys will also join us for next week's uh, topic, which will be on anxiety. So these two-part series um, will be covered by Yet Ping. So uh, Yet Ping, I'm going to hand it over to you. You can, uh, you know, just dive in. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Oh, it's good. Now I can see everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to share this afternoon with you. Hope we can learn something together. Uh, I'm going to share my slides now. I don't have a lot to share with you, so I hope uh, you don't mind if I go too fast, right? Just put in the chat, please slow down or something like that, okay? Yeah. Uh, we will have some Q&A time later, okay, after this, the slides. Okay. okay, yeah, you can see the slides, right? Okay, so um, my name is Yap Ping. I'm the principal counselor from Ojoy, and thank you very much, Vanessa, uh, for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, today, I'm here to share my knowledge and experience with you on mental health for seniors. And like what um, Vanessa has said, I've worked in Ojoy for 11 to 12 years, and I've come across many seniors who are suffering from depression and other mental health conditions. Uh, 
um, just a disclaimer here, I personally do not have depression or not yet. Uh, and I have not looked after a family member with depression. Um, but my knowledge comes from many medical doctors in hospitals. I've learned a lot from them. And especially from psychodiatricians like Dr. Ulelin, who is from uh, Changi General Hospital. She's very well known in the field of dementia in Singapore. And she's also my lecturer in um, SUSS when I was doing my master's in social work. Uh, she's also the clinical consultant of Old Joy. And uh, besides doctors and medical social workers, I also learn from my clients, especially my clients and their families. Um, although depression is a generic term or topic, right, for, for a condition, but everyone's depression is different and everyone's journey is different also. So what my clients share with me, you know, especially how they slowly overcome the challenges that depression threw at me. So that's why I'm able to, um, you know, share with you during this slide, I mean, this, this talk. Um, and then um, I think uh, I heard from um, Charmaine and Vanessa that many of you in the audience are seniors or are caregivers for seniors. Uh, some of you may have decided to attend this webinar to find out more about depression. Uh, for example, like, do I have depression uh, or does my mother or grandmother have depression? And if we do, right, what can we do about it? So I hope that by the end of the talk, you will have some answers to your questions. Yeah, okay, let's go on to um, like how common depression is. Okay, um, from studies conducted in Singapore, it is said depression is said to be the most common mental health condition among seniors in Singapore. So there's one study in 2016, the Singapore Mental Health Studies, it says that 6.3% of all adults in Singapore have major depressive disorder, right? And then there's another study uh, also in the same year. It says that um, among those above 60 years old in Singapore, the prevalence of depression is 3.7%. And the prevalence of subsyndromal depression is 13.4%. So if you add up 3.7 and 13.4, it's nearly 17%. So that means one in six seniors in Singapore have depression. Okay. Um, so what is the difference between um, major depressive disorder, you know, uh, or subsyndromal depression? So we'll go into that. So what I want to say is that depression is actually quite common in Singapore. You know, it's, it's not something that's very rare, okay? Um, then what is depression, right? Uh, we often heard people say, you know, I'm so depressed today. You know, my, my boss is not talking to me or my friend is not talking to me, I'm so depressed. But actually depression is, uh, can be quite clinical and it can be quite serious. It's a, it's a medical uh, condition, right? So these are some of the symptoms of depression. The most two important symptoms, right, are, are star here at the top here. Uh, feeling sad or depressed is one of the, you know, one of the symptoms that you must have before you can be diagnosed with depression. And then uh, very um, importantly also is the diminished interest in activities, okay? So you'll find that a lot of people with depression, they start to lose interest in the activities that usually they enjoy doing or they do, you know, on a daily basis. Then the others, like a significant change in appetite, you know, uh, sleep-wise and things like that, the, these other symptoms, right, um, you could have them in depression or you may not have them in depression, right? So for example, change in appetite, you could have poorer appetite than normal, you could eat less, and then you could start to lose weight. Uh, on the other extreme, right, you could become, you know, you, your, your appetite could have increased a lot and you can't stop eating and then you may gain weight. So um, gaining weight, losing weight is very, very common in adults. Then sleep-wise, you know, sometimes you'll find yourself, you want to just keep sleeping every day, you know, you, you're, not, you're not wanting to get out of bed, especially for those who do not have work or, or studies, right? They just want to stay in bed all day. Or, on the other hand, you could be not getting enough sleep, like you try to fall asleep, you can't fall asleep, or you sleep already, but then you keep waking up in the middle of the night, or throughout the whole night, right, your sleep is just not good enough, not rest, 
going yeah and then sometimes you will see that a person can become very restless when they're depressed they can't sit still they will start moving around the house uh, but most um, commonly is that they they start to feel very run down like they feel very tired you know they find that they are lying down in bed more often sitting down in chair more often yeah so then not enjoying the activities you want did, uh, feeling wiped out, fatigued, uh, feeling hopeless, worthless, or guilty. Um, this is very common, especially with the elders. Um, they may feel that they have become a burden to their family. So feeling a sense of being a burden is also one of the symptoms, right? Um, having trouble concentrating or making decisions. Yeah, because their focus is, is, is not so good already. They're quite withdrawn into their own world. So they may be less focused on what's going on outside. Yeah. And then they may also have thoughts of suicide or death. Um, it is very common. Uh, it's not that they want to kill themselves, huh? but the thought may come into their mind. Oh, maybe you should jump from the building or maybe you should jump in front of the car. Yeah, and these thoughts may just come without you thinking about them, you know, without any triggers. These, these are some of the symptoms of depression. Then there are other uh, less common uh, symptom will be psychosis, like hallucinations or delusions, you know, um, seeing things that people can't see, uh, hearing voices that I cannot um, hear, or sometimes even like having delusions, like, oh, maybe my husband is having an affair with a helper, which is not true. La. Yeah, so these are also some symptoms of depression that may come about, but it's not always present. So um, for a psychiatrist to diagnose you with major depressive disorder, right, you must have at least five or more symptoms. And the first two is a must, you know, and then you must have it daily or almost daily for more than two weeks. And then with that description, right, then the psychiatrist can diagnose you with major depressive disorder. So um, let's go and have a look at this slide. Um, I think this slide is very important because why I want to show is that um, if you look at here, right, this is the timeline, um, the x-axis, and then the y-axis, you have uh, the mood. You know, this is when you're very, very high. Mania means very, very high, very excited, very happy. And then here, all the way down is major depression. It's like you feel very, very sad, very, very depressed, very, very down. Okay, so for normal people, right, when we have our normal ups and downs, right, it's here. It's called eutymia. Basically, these are the normal ups and downs of every, everyday life, you know. Uh, when you get a raise, you're a bit happy, you know. Uh, when you get scored by boss, you become a bit down. Yeah, but so you can see uh, the difference in intensity. When you have sub-threshold depression or sub-syndromal depression, the intensity is almost like twice you know, as much. And then when you have major depression, it's even more. So why I want to show this slide is that um, a lot of times, so-called people who never had depression, we may suffer from downs of life, right? And then when we look at somebody with depression, you know, we, we, we may not be aware that their severity is so much different from what we normally experience as down. And then sometimes when we tell them, oh, snap out of it, you know? Don't, don't always think so negative about life and that, you know, just, just think positive. You know, we are very prone to share this kind of advice with others, but actually it doesn't really help them. It's not that they want to think like that. You know, there are other, later I'll share with you all the different causes for depression. And some, many of these causes is that something that they cannot control. Yeah, it's happening to the chemicals in the brain and so on. So that's why I want to show this slide that there's a big difference between the normal uh, down depressed state and a person with major depression. And then going to depression in seniors, like just now we say the study shows that more people, more seniors have sub syndromal depression. So what does that mean? That means if you go back to this slide, uh, they may not have five or more sim symptoms. They may have less than five. You know, but definitely the first two they will have, but then they may have something else like feeling hopeless or something like that. So 
So for a lot of seniors, right, they may not fit the criteria for major depressive disorder, but they do have some of the symptoms of low mood, you know, for a period of time. Then, um, a lot of times their symptoms also manifest as somatic or physical. Um, you may hear some of the elders, they may complain, you know, everywhere a pain, long zhong tian, you know, here, here pain, there pain. They may have headaches, they may have stomach ache. And then um, they go to see the doctor to see what's wrong. And then the doctor will check everything and then they say, you know, physically nothing is wrong with you. So that manifestation, could be a symptom of depression, but manifest in a physical way. Then there could also be cognitive changes. Like for example, we talk about the inability to focus, to concentrate, right? Um, so because of this, right, a lot of times when you ask them something, like what do you have for lunch? Uh, they may not remember. Why? Because they have not been focusing very much on what's going on outside. So they may start to um, appear to be very forgetful. So we call them pseudo dementia. In a sense, it's not real, real dementia, but the forgetfulness is due to the depression. Yeah. And then there are some atypical features, uh, which is usually not associated with depression, but in seniors, you may see them a lot. So maybe the person become more agitated. They also can become more irritable. Yeah, they may be, you know, shouting and scolding people all along, or every every time. Or they may also be um, hypersomnia. That means they are very sleepy during the day, and very tired during the day. So these are some of the more pronounced uh, symptoms in seniors. Okay, um, the next slide. Yeah, my. Um, Dr. Ng always uh, wanted us to not confuse depression with the two other Ds. So the other D is delirium, and then one more is fever. So what happens in delirium? Delirium is a acute confusional state, okay? Um, the person is very well one, you know, on an everyday basis, and then suddenly one day the person becomes disoriented, become very confused. They may start to like sleep a lot, hypoactive, they, they don't, they're not moving a lot. So this delirium is usually triggered by underlying medical illness. And if we do not send them to the hospital to be treated, can be associated with high mortality. So it's very important to differentiate um, between depression that usually um, evolves gradually you know, it's like starting to see the person getting a low mood more and more and things like that. But delirium is sudden onset. It happens very fast, you know, and the person is like totally changed. So in that case, right, in the case of delirium, we really have to call ambulance and send to the hospital. Then as for dementia, right, it's uh, described as a gradual progressive decline in memory, in thinking, in behavior, ability to perform daily functions. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are talks by the golden uh, concept on dementia. Uh, the thing with dementia is that it can also be associated with uh, depressive symptoms like STD. Okay, so um, basically these three Ds, right, they are not mutually uh, exclusive. So for some of the seniors that come to our center, right, they may start off having depression and then they develop dementia. Okay, it's like the depression is the, the starting point before they develop dementia. Um, and then there are a lot of um, seniors who already have dementia, they may start to have depressive features. And then a person with both depression and dementia can also de develop delirium. Yeah, so it's very important for us to try to understand the difference between the three. Okay, now I'm going on to share about the second section of my talk, which is uh, what causes depression or why depression. And uh, just now Vanessa was saying that um, Ojoy focuses a lot on biopsychosocial. So we use the framework biopsychosocial and depression can be viewed from the biopsychosocial perspective. 
So the probable causes for depression in the biological uh, field or the uh, perspective will be, uh, for example, we talk about chemical imbalances in the brain, you know, um, depletion of serotonin, dopamine, not enough, right? Uh, there could be genetic vulnerability. That means it runs in the family. We do see that. Um, so sometimes we will ask them, you know, do you have family members with depression? And if so, then it's, it's you know, it's more, more likely that the person can also develop depression. Or of course, if you have a previous history of depression, this could be a relapse, you know. Um, chronic alcoholism and substance abuse will also do damage to the brain and therefore will make a person very prone to develop depression, especially in their aging years, senior years. Yes. Yeah. And then there are medical conditions uh, linked to lasting significant mood disturbances. For example, thyroid hormone imbalances, uh, heart disease, motor neuron disease, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, lack of vitamin B12, and so on and so forth. Even menopause, you know, um, something that, that every woman will go through. It will cause hormonal fluctuations. And sometimes it may also um, causes a person to develop a low mood. And then, of course, by if you don't have enough sleep, you can also develop, you know, low mood. You know, the lack of sleep can cause people to be very irritable and things like that. Yeah. Then on the psychological uh, causes, risk factors will include your temperament, you know, your level of resilience, uh, your view of the world. Um, sometimes we hear people uh, often have this view that I'm not good enough, you know, I'm a failure. Um, or the world, everyone is against me and things like that. Uh, a lot of times we develop this kind of uh, worldview or perspective um, due to early childhood um, issues. Uh, like could be trauma, could be losses, you know, um, attachment problems. Yeah, so, so there will be those who maybe like they grew up in a, a, a family whereby there's a lot of abuse and there's a lot of trauma and then the person doesn't have as much resilience against the world, then they are more likely to develop depression. And then on the social side, oh, there's so many causes, okay? The list is not exhaustive. Like I'm listing some that is more common. Like some people, they lose their job, they get re they, they retire, they have nothing to do, you know, they have loss of income. Um, some homemaker, right, housewives, um, as, as they grow older, you know, suddenly the children wants their life to be better, so hire a helper to do all the housework for them. So they lose their role as a homemaker, and that could also cause somebody to develop depression. Um, then, of course, relationship problems, you know, you have breakup, separation, divorce, or you could lose your spouse through death. Some, some seniors, they may lose their children even, you know, um, pets. Um, and some of them, especially if they have terminal condition, like terminal illness like cancer, they're facing death, that could also cause them to develop depression. Um, and then um, mobility, which is very important to everyone. You know, once we lose our mobility, we lose certain function, we lose independence. Uh, and when we lose independence, sometimes we also lose dignity, you know. And then sensory impairment, like losing your vision, your hearing, your speech impairment, all this will affect your interaction with other people around you. So they may cause you to become more um, socially isolated with all these impairments. Then, of course, there's the actual social isolation. A, a person may be single all their life and then, you know, they're, they're always living alone or they may be married but they lose a spouse or they may be divorced. Um, some some seniors, they also feel very sad when their children leave the house, get married and things like that, so emptiness, yeah. And then some seniors, they will have like strained family relationships. Um, then you have other things like financial hardship, housing issues, lack, lack of basic needs. 
So all these are possible reasons for depression. So as you can see, there are many, many reasons for uh, triggering uh, depression. Um, so we, we call them complex biopsychosocial causes. Uh, for some people, maybe the bio stands a big part. Like for example, I have a senior who developed motor neuron disease and he's losing his ability to talk, even to move. So this is a very debil uh, debilitating uh, condition. Um, luckily for him, he has a good, um, you know, psychological, he, he's very strong in, in his mind. He has a very good faith in Buddhism. Uh, also, he has very strong family support. His uh, children and wife are all very supportive of him. So um, the major reason for his depression is due to the condition that he has. Um, then, of course, there will be those who, like I said, you know, grow up as a child in an abusive environment. So their psychological makeup already predisposes them to depression. And then, of course, um, for people like that, also sometimes the social, there's quite a lot of factors that, that causes them to, like, you know, um, they feel they're not good enough, then they're not doing well in school, then after that, they don't get a good job or, or earn a high pay, things like that. So those could also be factors. Um, then lastly, there could be some who has no uh, bio issues, not much psychological issues, but they have a lot of hardships. Uh, basically, their basic needs are not met. They have financial hardship, housing issues, you know, strained family relationships. So all this will result in them developing depression. So um, how do we know whether a person has depression? Um, the best is to go to a doctor for assessment. We call a psychogeriatrician, psychogeriatric assessment. So basically, the doctor will perform a clinical interview with the patient, with the caregivers, uh, will do a physical evaluation, will perform some blood tests to rule out um, medical conditions. Uh, where relevant, they may also do a brain imaging scan. Uh, they will do a social assessment, ask you some questions, and they may also ask you for your suicide risk assessment. Yeah. So because seniors, when they go to a psychodiatrician, the assessment is not only assessing for depression, they also can assess uh, for anxiety, they also can assess uh, dementia. So actually, it's very good if a senior can go for this psychodiatric assessment then we can find out really what is the issue la, that is troubling them. Yeah, so some of the questions that the doctor may ask is like, um, what are the symptoms, you know? Um, basically, yeah, uh, for depression, you'll be like, oh, low mood, you know? Um, then no interest in what I usually do. Like, I love to play mahjong, but now it's like, my friends ask me, and I say, no, 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 I don't want to go. No, no, not interested anymore. Yeah. How long have the symptoms been going on for? I don't know, is it more than two weeks or is it just starting, you know? And what is the cause for your depression? Do you know? Do you know if something triggers it? You know, for a lot of them will be losses, uh, could be functional decline, health decline, you know, losing spine, things like that. Yeah. Then are there periods she has been well? How impairing are the symptoms? You know, and so on and so forth. What are the support systems? So it's very important to know who can support the person who has been diagnosed with depression? Because it's the support system is going to help to, you know, lift the person out from depression. Yeah. So the last part, how to help. I think everyone is the most interested in this. You know, uh, once we know we have depression, how can we help, right? So again, there are the biopsychosocial uh, ways to help. For biological treatment, okay, first of all, the doctors, once they assess you, they will treat any reversible medical condition. So for example, my dad, he was having low mood for a while. And then when he went to the doctor, they found out that his thyroid hormones are a bit low. So they gave him some thyroid hormones to take. And then now, you know, no more low mood. So it's actually very re reversible. Right, and then of course you you will need to address any physical stresses like is there any chronic pain or discomfort. Uh, for medication wise, the antidepressants there are quite uh, many types of um, antidepressants. 
So these are some of the more common ones, citrulline, flulex, uh, flulectin, lutacetine, and so on. Uh, basically, right, some people have some misconception about um, psychotic medications. Okay, some psychiatric medications are addictive, but antidepressants are non-addictive. Okay, um, next week when we talk about anxiety, there are some medications for anxiety that are addictive, and the doctors usually will tell you, okay, don't take it uh, all the time, take it only when you need to. But for antidepressants, they are not addictive. They can improve your mood, appetite, sleep, concentration, but they do not take away your life stresses. Uh. So basically, besides taking medication, you still have to do something to remove your life stresses, right? Uh, some of the common side effects of antidepressants are increased appetite, weight gain, uh, dry mouth, constipation, fatigue, drowsiness, dizziness, etc. Uh, some people will have side effects, some people will not have developed side effects, and then some people may develop side effects with certain medication but not with others. So that's why, um, you know, having a lot of different medications, the doctors can um, choose to select the medications that will give you the least side effect. And sometimes the side effects are, are transient. That means they only occur for a short while, but after that, after your body get used to it, it will go away. Yeah. So it's very important to know all this. Uh, so for example, the doctor will start slow, uh, go slow and start low, which means that if the normal dosage that a person usually take is 30 milligram, they may start with 7.5 or 15. And especially seniors, right, they don't usually like go all the way up to adult doses. They will really start with very low dose, then see whether there's any side effects, how bad the side effects are, and then they will start to increase until you reach some stabilization. Uh, but the thing about antidepressant is that it takes about three to four weeks to take effect. Um, so because of that, right, sometimes uh, people take after one to two weeks, eh? No change, then no change, then they give up. Then it defeats the purpose. Like you, you, usually the doctor will tell you anyway when they give you the antidepressant. They will say, you know, you have to persist for three to four weeks. And then usually the next TCU, the next appointment will be in a month's time. Yeah, then the doctor will come back and review and say, you know, how are you doing and things like that. And then the thing is that um, you also have to take the medication, right? Uh, for another six to nine months after you feel stable. Yeah. So you will keep going back to the doctor, the doctor will keep reviewing. And then when you say, you know, I really feel very okay now, you know, I don't feel low mood and all, all those symptoms have gone away already. But the doctor wouldn't want you to stop immediately because if you stop immediately, right, sometimes the risk of relapse is higher. So the doctor will normally ask you all to keep taking for another six to nine months and then if you're really okay, okay, then they will gradually taper off, which means that um, they won't ask you to stop immediately. They will reduce the dosage, you know, so that your body will slowly, slowly come off the medication. Yeah. So it's very important to know all this like, when you're prepared to take the antidepressant. And the doctors will not always prescribe antidepressant. They also will see how severe your condition is. If you have more depression, I have seniors who... Don't, don't have uh, medications from the doctor. Yeah. Okay, then what if the patient is not getting better, right? So if after four to six weeks, they are not feeling better after the adequate dosage or adequate duration, right? Then uh, when you see the psychodiatrician, they may switch antidepressant, give you a different one, or they may combine two different antidepressants to give you a better effect or they may augment with other mood stabilizers like lithium, uh, normotrigine, carbamazepam. These are very common uh, that I've seen with my seniors that come to me. Uh, they may also add the uh, antipsychotic medication if there is impairing psychosis. Then the last one, right, the electroconvulsive therapy, ECT for short. Uh, this one is usually given if the person is not at all responsive to medication. And uh, I have come across quite a few seniors who actually had to take ECT because they are not responsive and their condition is getting worse and worse. You know, they become so lethargic. Um, they, they are lying in bed 
all the time. They're just staring at the ceiling. They're not talking to anyone. They don't want to eat and things like that. So it's so severe that they, they will actually, you know, um, not survive if they continue in that state. La. Yeah, so um, I have seen seniors who recover pretty well after ECT. Yeah, so um, if the doctor does recommend ECT to your loved ones, right, uh, when as a last resort, right, don't, don't be so fast to, um, you know, reject it because uh, it, it has, um, produces good effect. La. Yeah, so it's very important to talk to the doctor, ask all the questions you want about it, you know, how long it's going to take and things like that, what are the side effects and things like that, and then um, decide to go with it if it really, there's nothing else that can help your seniors, yeah. Um, and then, of course, the just now was the bio side. Right now, we go to the psychotherapy side. So this one um, is very common. I mean, Ojoy is an organization that provides counseling to seniors. Uh, very important that the seniors are comfortable with the idea of counseling. Last time, it used to be um, not so common for seniors to come for counseling. But now, because it's becoming more and more accepted, right? people are OK to come. Um, but they need to want to come, okay? You cannot force somebody to come for counseling if they are not interested or not, not um, willing to. And then the consent is very important. And language also very important. It's better to find a counselor who can speak similar uh, language. Like if your, first, your you know, mother or grandmother is more fluent in Hokkien and Cantonese, then you, if it will be best if you can you know, find a counselor that speaks the same language, it's easier. Yeah, so talk therapy or counseling, there are different modalities. Uh, CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is more for adults. Uh, for seniors, we might look at uh, geriatric focus, humanistic, grief work, reminiscence. That means um, talking about their past and finding their strength through the past. And also strength-based existential. Um, behavior activation is also very important um, because we find that for a lot of um, seniors who are depressed, right? When you're able to um, introduce certain activities that would actually bring them out from their depression. Yeah. So, uh, just an advertisement. Uh, this is uh, my clinical director many years back when she go and do a uh, home-based counseling for seniors. Yeah, so basically Audrey does provide um, home-based counseling uh, for seniors who are less mobile, like they're basically homebound. Yeah, so we are one of the very uh, few uh, centers that do, does that. Yeah. Um, and then continuing on, the last one would be social interventions, right? So it's very important to improve the quality of life and living. Um, we want to attend to their basic needs. Basically, we want to look at every you know, factor in their life. Like, are they eating well? Are they having a balanced diet? Are they having a variety of food? You know, especially some seniors, they may have some dental issues that they may start to only eat the softer food, then they may not have the necessary nutrition. So sometimes you may want to give them some of your favorite food. Uh, I know that um, it's a balance uh, between physical health and mental health. Uh, so some, some, some children, they are very strict. Uh, they say you have diabetes, so you cannot eat this, you cannot eat that. You know, you have high blood pressure, you cannot eat this, you cannot eat that. But sometimes we do have to add in some of their favorite food once in a while to cheer them up, all right? And then I think another very important thing is, uh, you know, eating with them. You know, sometimes um, if they eat alone, right, they may not want to eat a lot. But then when the children eat with them, uh, then suddenly, you know, they, they feel like they can eat more. Yeah. And then I have some seniors who doesn't want to take um, antidepressant. Uh, they will take their own um, natural supplements to increase their mood. Yeah. So it has worked well with some of my seniors. Like they, they will go to the pharmacy and you know search out for supplements. Um, and then another thing besides eating well is moving well, right? Yeah. So if we can move, we can go anywhere we want, we can be very independent. But if not, right, then we have to see, you know, what kind of assistance does the elderly need? Are they staying at home because of their depression or because they are afraid of falling because they have become more frail? So they didn't want to go out because if they start walking, they may fall down, break their, their hip or something. So I know a lot of seniors are very afraid of falls. Yeah, so um, 
is the is the living environment safe enough for them? You know, can they move about safely? Is there grab bars at home and things like that? And then for transport, right? Um, is it easy for them to move around outside? You know, um, some of the more fortunate seniors they have their children who will chauffeur them around. Some will be able to afford to order grab for them and things like that. Yeah, so then it's much easier for them to move out and interact and socialize. Yeah. Um, sleeping well, so we want to know whether are they sleeping at night? Are they having enough sleep uh, at night? Uh, but some seniors, they have nothing to do, you know, during the day. So at night, they also cannot sleep because they are just lying around, you know, during the day. So it's, it's, it's good to engage them in more activities during the day so that they feel tired, then they can go to sleep at night. That's why a lot of times, uh, uh, children will, 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 will um, ask their seniors to go and attend daycare. So at daycare, they have many activities to keep them entertained and stimulated. Yeah, and then it's very important also to have a routine. So by a certain time, you know, like, you know, I have dinner at this time, then maybe I watch a bit of TV and then at this time go to sleep. When there's a routine, right, it's easier to follow it, you know, and easier to cultivate good sleep. Uh, sleep hygiene, yeah. And then we also want to monitor whether the senior is um, seeing their doctor, uh, are they taking their medication? Uh, if they're being forgetful, you know, is there somebody at home that will help to, you know, make sure that they take their medication? Uh, are their conditions well managed? Um, and then sometimes I see a lot of seniors, they go to the polyclinic, right? I see a lot of seniors on their own. So when they see the doctor, they are on their own. And then sometimes the seniors cannot really absorb or hear what the doctor have to say to them. So uh, if possible, right, try to, you know, for the children, right, try to accompany your seniors to see the doctor. Or if you are a senior, right, uh, don't be so paise and, and tell, you know, um, like they don't want to trouble children and things like that. But I think it's important uh, you if you have more than one, you can, you know, share out and things like that. Even if you only have one, maybe sometimes you ask the, the child to go with you rather than all the time you just go on your own. Yeah. Um, maintain personal hygiene. Personal hygiene is very important if you're all the time dirty and things like that, soil and things like that. How, how do you be happy, right? It's very difficult. So um, it's important to find out whether the seniors, are they able to take care of themselves? Are they still able to shower themselves or wear the clothes properly themselves? Uh, whether is it possible to provide pull out pants so that they can still wear it and provide them with dignity rather than having somebody to wrap the diapers, you know, for them. Yeah. And then, um, you know, living in a clean and cluttered environment. So um, is the senior able to clean the house? Do they need help? You know, is the, is the place uh, safe enough for them to move around? Yeah. So all these are very important. These are all the basic needs. And some seniors really don't have these basic needs met. Yeah, so, um, you know, as family or as friends or as uh, professional helpers, we will go in and attend to them, make sure that they have all these needs met. And then of course, if um, finance is a problem, then we will try to provide financial aid. Um, some elderly, they, they are too shy to ask money, get money from their children, and they, they deprive themselves. Lah. So I think it's important for children to remember like, to provide some kind of pocket money for their parents. Yeah. Um, then of course, other things like keeping themselves physically uh, active, you know, going out to the sun, getting vitamin D. You know, recently the government has been giving out bottles of vitamin D for those uh, blue and orange trust cards, uh, seniors and vulnerable uh, people. It, it, vitamin D is also good for improving the mood. Yeah. So, but you can get vitamin D by going to the sun, uh, going under the sun. So that's helpful. So go for walks, simple exercises, you know, Tai Chi, yoga, swimming, cycling. Sometimes when people are depressed, they may not really want to go out. Uh, sometimes if family members have the time, I right, can do it with them, you know? Like like some, some of my seniors say that, oh, because my cousin is going and my cousin keeps asking me to go, so I go because I don't want to let them down. Yeah, so if by themselves they may not want to go, but when somebody else is going with you, right, then then it's easier to, to, to go. Yeah. Uh, promote 
interest and meaning. So you schedule activities, hobbies, you know, keep, keep the seniors engaged at home. You know, some simple chores that they can still do, uh, let them do. Like um, some, some of my seniors, they may not be able to cook anymore, but they can supervise the helper. They may uh, tell the helper how to cook and things like that. So they still have a role, you see. Yeah, so have to keep uh, noticing and observing what are the things that seniors can do. Don't try to make them completely free, you know, like like the helper will do everything for you. You just relax and be tight, tight. But you know, that is actually not, not good uh, for seniors. Yeah. Um, then, you know, create legacy, appreciate them for what they've done in the past. Uh, some ways of creating legacy will be, you know, putting together photo albums or, or, or writing down recipes, you know, uh, or, or just talking about the past, you know, and just appreciating them for what they have, you know, done for us. Um, then improve social interactions, um, yeah, increase visits. Well, last time the circuit breaker, uh, we do have a lot of seniors uh, who calls in for help because they're so depressed or anxious because of, you know, lack of uh, social interaction. So luckily that period is not very long. Uh -huh. yeah, so now people are much better because now the family can visit them. Yeah, but uh, now we also have technology, like we can do video chats, you know, can actually see the person face to face. Yeah, um, all this regular contact with friends or befrienders or senior activity center or social daycare, all these are very important for seniors. Yeah, so um, also providing them with love and care, uh, being patient with them. I think being patient is very important because depression is not, uh, you know, like cold or flu, you know, you go to see a doctor, you take medicine, oh, you're better already. Uh, no, so um, it will take a while for them to recover. So we have to be very patient. Maybe today you ask them, you want to go out for a meal, they say don't want, you know, they want to eat at home. So you accompany them and eat at home. But then maybe next week you ask again, hey, would you like to go for a meal? You know, we go somewhere close, you don't have to be very far from home, then we'll come back quickly, that kind of thing. Yeah, so we need to journey with them at their pace, basically, and not to give up. Yeah. So, um, Again, biopsychosocial treatment. Uh, there are some who will benefit very well with antidepressant. They hardly require any psychosocial treatment. They just eat antidepressant, they, they get better. There are some people who are like that. There are some who requires a bit more counseling, you know, and then there are some who requires a lot of help in the social um, uh, area. So that's why I say every depression, everyone, you know, is different. The uh, reasons are different, the uh, treatment are different. Um, and then if we are talking about the order and combination, right, it depends. La. But a lot of people, they will start with social intervention first. La. They try to, you know, make sure the person is okay and things like that. If they feel like no matter what they are doing, it still cannot help the, the senior, right, then they may ask the senior to go for um, counseling, psychotherapy. Um, and you know, or concurrently with biological treatment. Yeah, so biological treatment is actually very important um, if the social and the psycho interventions are not helping or it's very slow to help. So um, don't shy away from taking medicine if it's really important, like, you know, the condition is really serious, um, your functioning is impaired and things like that. It's good to take antidepress uh, antidepressants, yes. And then, of course, we have to assess for suicide risk. Like if the, the risk is very high, then the person needs to be hospitalized and monitored in the hospital. Yeah. So, um, okay, then here I have some slides, right? Uh, this is an elderly lady who is, I think, the uh, owner of the store or something like that. So she said, as long as there's work to do, I will not be tired. And look at her face, so cheerful, right? So smiley. Yeah. And then, okay, here you have a group of friends eating, you know? Yeah, um, if you can eat together, then you can be happy together, right? Okay, here we have, uh, I think, a, a granddaughter or a volunteer, you know, doing some engaging activity with the elderly. Uh, I think when you want to do activities with elderly, it's very important that you don't um, make them feel like they are like a child. So the activity shouldn't be too childish, like it must be also uh, suitable to their level so that they can enjoy doing it. They don't feel like, you know, they are failing to be able to do the activity, yeah. 
Okay, then you have physical exercises. Um, then, you know, all kinds of physical exercises, right? You have the senior um, exercise machines downstairs. Uh, now it's very common in the HDB estate. Then there are, you know, groups of seniors who go for cycling or, or do, do stretching together, you know, this place, basketball, this one is in the pool, you know, and then this is what they call the lawn bowling kind of uh, game, right? Yeah. And then this is another kind of exercise, uh, the dry swim, swimming kind of exercise. Yeah, so you can see everyone is very happy inside here. Uh, it's also helpful because it stimulates the mind mentally. Yeah, besides the social part. Uh, yeah, then here you have other things like, you know, uh, com communicating frequently with your loved ones, going out with grandchildren, you know, singing together, cooking together. Yeah, all these are all very good like hiking, you know, going to gardens and things like that. Yeah, and then some people like to fish or, you know, be with birds, you know, or even, you know, pets. Being able to cuddle a pet is also very helpful. Yeah, so basically, um, I think to help someone with depression, you have to be very creative. Uh, you have to know what, uh, you know, what, what would connect with them. Uh, but first, right, you also have to take care of yourself. Like if you're the caregiver, right, you have to love yourself first, then to have compassion for self, right? Um, I think we're all humans, right? Uh, so sometimes we can be a bit more, um, you know, sometimes we can be irritated and, and anxious and things like that, but be, be kind to self, like, you know, stop talking negative about yourself. Uh, accept yourself for your limitations. Uh, capitalize on your strengths, and then you care for yourself uh, physically, emotionally, spiritually, you know, so you can ask, la, you know, like, what am I thankful for? What am I good at? You know, what tears me down and what feeds my soul? Yeah, so self-love, self-care, very important for caregivers. Then you can uh, take care of your seniors better. So here I have some um, helplines for caregivers and also here we have the old joy um, address and you know, telephone number. So if you need any help, um, you can also call in and seek help from us. Yeah. So, well, okay, that's it. Um, last part is Q&A. So uh, I shall stop share. Yeah, okay. Do anyone have any questions? You can either, I think, ask directly or you can put it in the chat. Mm. Oh, I hear some voice. Who is this? Uh, oh, uh, anyway, if you guys have any questions, um, yeah, you can, I, you can put it in the chat. Um, if not, after this, we'll also be flashing some contact uh, that you can uh, reach out to uh, Yeping directly. Um, also, we'll be sending the slides to you all in the post event email. So, not to worry if you find that there's some content that you missed, right? Um, uh, Yeping has kindly offered her entire deck. So, we will send it uh, out to you, all of you, so you can view that. Um, yep, I think if we have no questions, we can just uh, show our last slide. and. Um, so on the left side, you, that would be the link, uh, the QR code to, I think we're all very used to scanning the QR codes by now. So um, on the left side would be for the OJOY website. And on the right side, uh, it's our ebook content that you can, uh, you can just go to this link to find out the ebooks that we have uh, relating to the topic. So I think we do have one on dementia. And yeah. Um, just a reminder that this will be the first part of two parts. So next week, we'll be having a, a talk on anxiety, also by Yet Ping, um, which will be hosted exactly at the same time at 5 p.m. So only after that, then we will do the feedback form thing. So for today, right, uh, in our chat, uh, which you can access at the bottom bar, you just click on the, 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 the icon chat, you can see uh, we're going to send you two, two links. The first link would be for registration for the second talk. I understand you're already registered, but um, it will just be a link that will be accessible by the chat. Line. So you can just click on there, it'll be easier. And then there will be a reminder that will be sent to all those registered participants on the 
uh, nearing the event next week. Yeah. And besides that, um, I think a lot of you have expressed that uh, WhatsApp is a great way to you know, get some updates or even for events like the entrance, uh, the entry link to this event. Uh, it'll be much easier for us to reach out to you via WhatsApp. So what we have eventually, uh, what we have created was a, a, a TGC, uh, I mean, Golden Concepts, uh, WhatsApp broadcast list. So um, if you are all right, you can just uh, click on our, the link that we have also shared in the chat. Uh, once you click on it, you'll be like kind of like a sign up uh, to give uh, us your mobile number that we can add you into the WhatsApp broadcast list. The good thing about the broadcast list versus creating a WhatsApp group is that it's only one way, so um, there won't be any spamming or any messages that are unrelated. Uh, we only send out uh, messages very occasionally, only when events are happening or when there's a upcoming talk or reminder or basically only in essential information. So we would like it to be uh, um, uh, the, the, the easiest way for us to communicate with all of you. So um, the link is ready in the chat. Uh, and we'll also be linking it in our post-event email. So you can also check it out then. So for, yeah, I think we had quite a good turnout today. Um, do remember to share the registration link for part two with your friends also. Um, on Zoom, we can host up to 100. So don't worry, just feel free to invite your friends uh, for part two next week at uh, 5 p.m. And yeah, I think that's about it from us.